Passion. It was the great Byron who wrote, The holy rood of the mind is far more desired for witness in the play of the druids than are all the circles of moon fantasy in the forests of moon mist lore. In the fog of the subconscious, there hang great and entwining branches that point strange fingers toward you and seem to whisper in the midnight breeze, Art thou a doubter of my work? You will hear the story of such in a moment when Theodore Osborne creates the role of Edgar Allan Poe in the story of the solitary genius, a man surfeited with a black and morbid and horrible obsession. It was again the blind poet Homer who said, Genius, is a state between heaven and hell. And he who shall there reside will neither be understood nor yet have mundane understanding. He will never be forgiven, nor will he heed sup forgiving. He shall always stand solitary and alone, to be scorned yet have no wit for scorning. Such was the precarious estate of the tragic Edgar Allan Poe. Within the whirls and convolutions of his brain, there sprang dazzling flashes of the pure white light of fantasy. And the times, in contrast, there formed eddies and whirlpools and turgid thoughts of black despair and melancholia. He was a man within himself, a man neither understood nor understanding. That is, with but one exception... There was but one beautiful and ethereal light of his existence. The light he immortalized forever and eternal in the sweet and pathetic lyrics of Annabel Lee. That was the celestial name he gave to her. Of course, her earthly name was Virginia Clem. wonderment can inspire such music, then I beg of you to continue your wonderment, my dear. Oh, oh no, no, please, don't <laughs> stop playing. That melody of yours fills this room of our little house until it becomes as the marble halls of iron. How many times have I told you about flattery turning my head? Do you suppose flattery might turn your head sufficiently for me to kiss your lips? <laughs> oh, my dear, it's just so silly and so wonderful. And, and I love you so. No, oh, dearest. Thank you. You know, Virginia... If love were the only coin of the realm, none could be as wealthy as we. And I would buy you gowns of lace, jewels of the most priceless. And you should live in a palace of Italian marble with 40,001 servants to do your bidding. Oh, which reminds me, Edgar. The butcher called today asking again about his bill. He threatened to cut off our credit. Oh, if I were only St. George and that infernal butcher a dragon, how I would thoroughly enjoy skewering him upon my spear and... What did you tell him? What was it I could tell him? Tomorrow, perhaps the next day, perhaps the day after. I had no money in the house, you know. Yes, I know. I wonder why a poet must always be forced to starve, freeze, and eat cheese in the garret like a mouse. Oh, we shan't always starve and freeze, Edgar. Someday you'll be famous. Oh, I just know it. I'm sure of it. Yes, you're as sure of it as you are of tomorrow's breakfast. But, darling, there's no need to become disheartened. There's no reason for us to be unhappy and discouraged. Why, Edgar, look what we have that the others haven't. Yes, mildewed linen, moldy bread, and a shack over our heads that even cattle would be disgraced. We have love, my dearest, and freedom. Freedom? Yes. Look, Edgar. At what? That bird sitting on that old stump out there. I I think it's a raven, isn't it? Mm, yes. On the surface, his life is black and ugly, but, but his soul is free. Why, the spaces of the heavens belong to him. 
he can fly under the sun. <laughs> but I'll bet he can't write poetry. No, he can't. But you can. His wings give him flight. But your poetry gives you flight that shall last beyond the life of... Oh, that silly old bird. Yes. Perhaps. Beyond your life, Edgar, you shall live. And beyond his life, there will be nothing. Your life, our lives, why, they shall be forevermore. And his life shall be nevermore. Nevermore, quoth the raven. Nevermore. Uh, Virginia, excuse me, I'm going to my room. You're going to your room? Yes, to my room. And Virginia, don't disturb me. The raven is going to quote nevermore. And Edgar Allan Poe, in that one word, I promise you, shall live forevermore. In the frenzy of inspiration, Edgar went to his room, sat at his desk, and pondered head in hands just how he should plan this poem. He did it all rationally with sober reason, not in abandoned drunken madness, as it has been said. His was the frenzy which all poets know, the poetic frenzy of inspiration that drove him on and held his thoughts to their purpose. Thus it was that he planned first the length, then the impression and tone of the poem, planned the refrain, and finally, he wrote the last part first, so that he would have some definite entity toward which to build. In this way, Edgar Allan Poe worked in that poor, cheap little house, and so grew those 108 lines of mournful and never-ending remembrance, the raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many, many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while he nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came... Is some visitor tapping at my chamber door? Only this and nothing more. It was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Vainly he had sought to borrow from his books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, of the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. But presently his soul grew stronger, and hesitating then no longer, he opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word. Lenore? This he whispered, and an echo murmured back the word. Lenore! Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all his soul within him burning, soon again he heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Open here he flung the shutter. When with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. And perched upon the chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. So thy crest be shorn and shaven. Thou art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, from the nightly shore. Then quoth the raven... But he marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. But the raven, sitting lonely upon the door, spoke only that one word. <laughs> Prophet raven, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven... <laughs> But that word, our sign of parting, get thee back into the tempest and the night's Plutonian shore. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Then quoth the raven. <laughs> and the raven, never flitting, still is sitting just above the chamber door. And his eyes have all the meaning of a demon that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. 
and the soul from out that shadow shall be lifted. my dear. No more moldy bread and cheese that even the mice refuse. Oh, Virginia, my dearest, we're rich and we're... Oh. What's the matter, Edgar? Darling, what is it? Didn't they buy it after all? Yes, Virginia. They bought it. Listen. Yes? For all rights, privileges, publications, and copies for your poem, The Raven. Please find enclosed check in the amount. In the amount of ten dollars, Virginia. We are rich indeed. Nevermore. The beautiful Annabel Lee. The sweet chime of music. That was to Edgar Allan Poe the very essence of life, died out upon the morning air. And there by the wild sea pounding, and in the presence of heaven's angels, he buried her. Then his footsteps turned, and the predestined track led him on to a new and strange experience. In the ancient scroll, it is written that the angel Israfel gives to his chosen only once in 10,000 years the power of vision into the future. Edgar Allan Poe, the chosen of this angel, had caught that prophetic crystal from the realms above, had held it, guarded it in his heart, and now he stands without the portals of the strange and foreboding house of Roderick Usher. In his own words, hear him tell in a flash of genius the most startling narrative that mortal ear has ever caught. As I approached the ancient domain of Usher, I sensed a peculiar atmosphere, one which had no affinity to the air of heaven, but which reached up from the decayed trees and the gray walls and the silent town, a pestilent and mystic vapor, dull, sluggish, faintly discernible, and leaden hued. And I became aware of a great factor, or crack, which, extending from the roof of the building in front, made its way down the wall in a zigzag direction until it became lost in the sullen waters of the town. I crossed the heavy bridge of the moat and went, filled with that ominous feeling, to the ancient portal of the house of Christ. My friend, Roderick Usher. I wish shelter and warmth. Tell your master that an old friend has come to call. That his name is Edgar Allan Poe. Very well. You may come in. You will wait here in the hall while I inform Mr. Usher of your arrival. As the cadaverous servant disappeared into the gloom of the long, vaulted corridor... My gaze wandered to the tomb-like structure of my surroundings. I say tomb-like only to describe the decaying furnishings and architecture in which I felt strangely confined. Ancestral portraits hung loosely and dull within cracked, cobwebbed frames. Grinning masks of armor peered out from the shadows. A great circular staircase wound and coiled like some black, ugly serpent into the reaches of the room. Poe. Edgar Allan Poe. 
Roderick. Upon my life, I've never been so surprised. Let me look at you. It is you, isn't it? It is Edgar Allan Poe, not some uh, specter come to haunt these halls of Usher. It is truly I, Roderick. And I think it is only weariness, hunger and cold, which lend me this specter's mask. I hope I haven't intruded. Intruded? My good man. Well, let me say that no visitor to this house has ever been more welcome than yourself. Oh, but come, we'll not stand here in the draft of the hall. We'll repair to the warmth and comfort of my studio. Will you allow me to lead the way, my friend, Edgar Allan Poe? Now, now, if you will comfort yourself with the fire and the great chair, we'll talk. And I think we have much to say, haven't we? You have much, and I have little. But tell me, Roderick, how's it been? Have you been well? Since you've asked, I can only tell you the truth, Edgar. I trust it shan't frighten you or disturb your visit. I fear that I am falling heir to the same sickness which has held my sister in its bondage. Are you speaking of Madeline? Do you mean to tell me that she's ill? Oh, yes. But I can't conceive of illness striking such beauty of both body and soul that is Madeline. The Madeline that I knew. Life is a strange thing, Edgar. Oh, uh, will you excuse me, please? Yes, come in. Well, Philip, what is it? I beg your forgiveness for this intrusion, sir. Yes, yes. I have just returned from the room of the Lady Madeline, sir. She, she is worse? She, she wants me to come to her? No, sir. I beg to inform you, sir, that the Lady Madeline is dead. Ladies and gentlemen, as the lips of the servant of Usher pronounce the dread word, the Lady Madeline is dead. Slowly the great ancestral clock hits devouring the minutes and hours that passed in morbid reverie. The bells of the tower still swayed in their half-crazed dance, and I found myself standing with Roderick Usher within the subterranean copper line vault that was now the tomb of his lovely sister, the Lady Madeline. Roderick. Roderick. Yes. Will you not leave her side now? To gaze upon death too long, my friend, is destructive to the soul of the living. Yes, I know. But Edgar, I, I can't believe it. Somehow my mind refuses to accept the truth. This is my sister. No, oh, Roderick. This was your sister. Oh, Edgar, please, please. Look at me, Roderick. And listen. Life is the end. Death is the start. And only through death may life begin. The survival constructive value of this life is the only medium through which man, civilization, empires may achieve the ultimate of perfection. In the fulfillment of the two cardinal laws of God, birth and death, do we only see beauty in its most perfect form? All things must end, Roderick, before they can begin. And not as consolation, not as condolence, do I say to you that death is the life of everlasting peace and triumph, that before the dawn of that perfect era of creation shall break, before we stupid infinitesimal Minutiae of commonplace episodes shall find the perfect karma of achievement, peace without war. A metamorphosis of death must decay this flesh of the lust and germinate the cell of new life that shall be forever without the pallor of death. But Edgar, surely... Yes. These things I know, Roderick. How I know? Why? But I do know them. As surely as I know that as man shall die, so shall civilization. That as the selfish forms of social organization shall fall, so also shall fall the house of Usher. And then, Roderick, then will come the miracle of birth and the phenomenon of everlasting life. 
the days wear on. In Roderick Usher, last of the symbolic line that reaches far back into the history of civilization, sinks deeper into his morbid shell. Only his music, the strange, half-mad innuendo of sound that seems to emanate from the depths of his soul, continues on through the murky nights and lyric days to console him. Then, knowing that human companionship alone can hope to break this introverted mania, Edgar Allan Poe breaks in upon the solitary usher and diverts him from his vigil of lone sorrow. Roderick. Roderick. Yes. You must stop this. You must put an end to this means of self-torture, Roderick. If you don't, you shall go mad. And I shall go mad. Body and soul can't stand it. Edgar. Yes. Edgar. My sister is dead. And your sister's brother shall also become dead if you don't cease this vigil of wanton self-effacement. Have you ever heard the voices of silence? Have you ever listened to the words of condemnation echoing from the shadowed corners, from rooms, from hallways? No. Roderick. Don't give way to hysteria. This is no hysteria. No, I'm not mad. Not insane. The voices I've heard were not the mumblings of imagination. I tell you, Edgar Poe, they were real. Repeating the same words over and over. What words? She is not dead. She is buried alive. In the name of God, Roderick. Wait, wait, Poe. Listen. I hear nothing. Edgar Poe, look as I am looking. See as I am seeing. And if your eyes do not see as mine, then I am truly bereft of reason. Mad, insane. The door. Madeline. Oh, God, the Father of Christ. The Madeline. Madeline. Roderick. Why have you done this to me? Oh. Madeline. Roderick Usher fell with a mad shuddering upon the now lifeless corpse of the sediment enfolded sister. From that chamber and from that mansion I fled aghast. And suddenly there shot along the path a wild light. And while I gazed, the crack in the castle rapidly widened. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. And there came then through the brilliance that can come only from catastrophe. A strange and perplexing sight of things to come. You have been listening to Obsession.